Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please bow and pray with me. Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. Bring clarity where there is confusion. Bring power where there is weakness. Bring joy where there is sorrow. For we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Well, greetings. Glad that you still came back, even though I left you for a week, although I was watching <laughs> on a boat, mind you, and at, on, on Lake Martin. But uh, I was very thankful for Jim to uh, preach in my stead. I'm very excited to continue on this journey through 1 Corinthians, and not just 1 Corinthians, but really chapter 15, because this is a, a dense passage, isn't it? And that's where we find ourselves in the remaining verses, and this is where we pick up. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? But we all long for victory, don't we? Whether it's on the field of competition, like in the Olympics, which I'm sure many of you are gearing up for right now. I just read this morning about Team USA, which means the basketball team. And I'm a big fan of the 92 Dream Team, if you remember that, uh, where our players were literally jumping over and dunking over, you know, (laughs) other players. But in an exhibition game, because it's not the Olympics yet, Team USA actually lost a game to Team Nigeria, a team whom last Olympics they beat by 43 points. And two Olympics ago, they beat by 83 points. So everyone is uh, a miss. What, what is going on with Team USA? They've lost. We all long for victory, don't we? Not just the competition field, but also on the field of battle. This is what Sir Winston Churchill once famously declared. He said, you ask what is our policy? I can say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. That is our policy. You ask what is our aim? I can answer with one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory, there is no survival. Man, his last sentence really rings true. Without victory, there is no survival. Now, victory presumes two things. Number one, you've got to have an adversary. And number two, that winning is better than losing. I think all of us would agree with that. I mean, some people are more competitive than others. And I'm sure some of you are very competitive. But all of us, whether we admit it or not, are competitive. See, we all are competing in one form or another in life. And whether we set the rules or someone else does, we are all seeking to win. Paul's discussion about victory is in reference to our ultimate adversary. You know what that is? Death. And in our passage, we're going to examine the victory that Christ has won over it. And as we turn there, we're going to discover three things that Paul is highlighting. He is looking at the resurrection body, the uh, mystery of the resurrection, and the resurrection victory. So first, the resurrection body. It is natural to assume that bodies will not rise from the dead, for the resurrection is counterintuitive to our own experience. We've not seen it. Thus, you had believers in the Corinthian church begin to ask in verse 35, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And I love Paul's response because he shows that in nature itself, we find that it is counterintuitive. He says, look at the seed that you sow into the ground in verse 37. Does it come out from the ground looking the same way? And just think about that for a moment. I mean, just think about an acorn, right? Now, if you don't know anything, if you're not an arborist or you've never, you know, studied plants or whatever, if you saw an acorn, could you ever fathom that out from this tiny silly-looking little seed would pop a majestic oak tree. I mean, that doesn't follow, does it? And yet, 
that's what happened. It's transformed. So it will be with our resurrected bodies, Paul is telling us. Like the seed, though we are buried, God will bring about a majestic transformation. Paul is far from being finished, though. No, he is just getting warmed up. Next, he points out how the resurrection body lines up with what we know about the different kinds of creatures on earth. This is what he says in verse 39. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Just because we might not be able to conceive of a body that is different than the one we are currently enjoying doesn't mean it's impossible. For God has created all kinds of different bodies, and each one is suited to its environment. The animal for the land, the bird for the air, the fish for the sea. God, you see, is creative. And just as we notice all the different kinds of animals that fill our planet, so we should not be surprised at his ability of creating a new body that is superior to our earthly body. It is superior, he says in verses 42 through 43, in the fact that it is imperishable and raised in in glory and power, rather than perishable and subject to the dishonor of death, disease, and decay. Isn't it interesting how we all long for this? I mean, look at the health, the fitness, and the cosmetic industries. They all key in on this, you know. They, They recognize we are decaying, aren't we? That's what they key in on, and they sell us the tools needed to combat sickness, old age, and decay. I wasn't going to say this, but it stuck out to me because while we were at the lake, we were uh, out there floating on some beach, and I noticed the little dog they have, which is Yippie. You you know what I'm talking about, the little Yippie dogs? Okay, so you know that one. And this dog has like this really beautiful gray hair. And I was commenting to our friends, hey, they have gray hair. To which Trey, my friend, said, hey, it's just like yours. (laughs) What? And all of a sudden, it just begins to hit. We're decaying, you know, as we live, so we are dying. And so this all just comes to me. And, of course, these industries, these fitness, these cosmetic, all these different things recognize this. But, you know, they can only delay the inevitable, can't they? Christianity, however, is the one worldview that says the desire to overcome death, disease, and decay is not only right, but it is possible. How? Well, only through the resurrection. The resurrection body of which Christ, Paul says, is the first fruits. Thus, Paul concludes in verses 47 through 49, The first man was from the earth a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And, it, and as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Now, after my last sermon, Several of you came up, you know, and you were saying, you know, Matt, we're made from the dust, and we're heading back to dust. You know, how do we make sense of that? And evidently, Paul perceived what you were going to ask, (laughs) because he literally says this to us. He anticipated your question. And in these verses, he points out that our bodies are inherited from Adam. Adam, you see, was the first federal head of humanity. That is, he was our representative. And yet, he fell into sin, and thus he plunged all of humanity from that point on into sin and into death and into our hair growing gray. That's what we find. The only way to change the sad story is if somehow a second Adam were to appear who was also our representative and our federal head. And guess what Paul is telling us? Such a man has appeared, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he did what Adam failed to do, namely to obey God. Though we inherited our perishable bodies from this first Adam, all those who turn towards the second Adam, Jesus Christ, will receive supernatural bodies through the resurrection. And uh, this isn't anywhere in my notes, but I mean, look at Jesus' resurrection body. It's a little bit different than ours, isn't it? I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't pass through walls. Can you do that? And yet they're still physical because he ate the fish. Remember? He disappeared 
when he was on the road to Emmaus and they sat down for supper, and then in a moment, boom, gone. A little bit different than our bodies, don't you think? But even in that, you get a little glimpse of what is in store. So that's the resurrection body. But that leads us to our second point, which is the resurrection mystery. This is what Paul says in verses 50 through 52. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. It's easy to get puzzled by what he says. Because he's saying flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God in verse 51. But he also contrasts the natural and the spiritual body. Now this is puzzling because hasn't he just insisted on the bodily resurrection? I mean, has he lost his mind? Is he contradicting himself? And isn't flesh and blood just another way of saying the body? I'm glad you asked. Because no, it's not. When Paul uses the word flesh, sarx in the Greek, or natural body in verse 44, he means that there's something wrong with the material in question. Either the material is in rebellion against God, or it is perishable and it is dying, or both. He explains what he means immediately afterwards in verse 53, where he says, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. You see, our present flesh and blood will decay and die. But God intends to create a world in which decay and death do not exist. And Paul is telling us that this reality has been inaugurated in the person of Jesus Christ. And this truth is the central point that he has been driving at in this entirely long chapter, chapter 15. Interestingly, he says, we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in verse 51, which means that not all Christians will die when the end comes. However, all will still need to be transformed from perishable to imperishable, from mortality to immortality. He says that it will happen in a flash, and I love it, in the twinkling of an eye. In that moment, all the enemies of God's people will be defeated, but especially sin and death. This mystery of the resurrection has fascinated me for the past couple of weeks because we see non-believers seeking to prolong their lives. I mean, it's, I mean, to me, it begs the question, you know, why are you doing that? You know, again, if we came from nothing and we're heading towards nothing, who cares about what's going on right now? And it's not just seeking to prolong life. You know that there's a lot of people that are seeking life that exists outside of our world. I mean, you don't believe me, just look at the headlines. NASA, for example, is in the search for life outside of our planet. And right now, they're looking at Jupiter's moon. Europa. Now, that's not it, because you know what happened on June 25th, don't you? Does anyone know what happened on June 25th of this year? There were a lot of documents that were declassified for the first time in, man, uh, I mean, more than 60, 70 years. Do you know what those documents were? UFOs! Why are we all so excited about this question of whether or not we are alone in the universe? And you see, it's, it's not just believers, it's unbelievers. I mean, they're caught up in it. They want to prolong life. They're looking for life. Left. Life has to continue past this world. It's got to be there. That's what they're saying. Why is that? I'll tell you why. It's because we are made in the image of God. And deep inside all of us, there is something that tells us that we are not alone that life does continue, that life does exist outside of our world. Ironically, while we are searching for contact from life outside our world, life from outside our world has already contacted us. Do you know how? The incarnation! That's what the incarnation of Jesus Christ is all about. He is life, right? And He has made contact with us, God Himself in the flesh, in Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our third point, which is the resurrection victory. Paul says in verses 54 through 55, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
Because of Christ's victory over death, we now know that nothing we do for him will ever be wasted or lost. We can be steadfast in our service, unmovable in suffering, abounding in ministry to others because we know that our labor will not be in vain. In fact, what Paul proclaims here is an answer to what Solomon lamented some 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. You remember what his lamentation in Ecclesiastes was? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What difference does it make what I do? We're all going to die anyways. Man, seems very similar to our culture, doesn't it? He went on to say in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 20 through 22, All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward? Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Man, is that not the question of our age? But you know, God has an answer for that, and Paul supplies it. And the answer is, the man from heaven Jesus Christ. As Paul goes on to say in verse 47, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man, Jesus Christ, is from heaven. And because of Christ, this life and our actions do matter. Thus Paul concludes in verse 58, therefore be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in, guess what, vain. You see, Christ's resurrection victory is central to our life and worship, and it motivates us to press on even when the world presses in. Speaking of the world pressing in, how does our culture teach us to respond to the frustrations of life? Well, it tells us that we need to become healthier, stronger, smarter, richer, and more beautiful than others in order that we can assure ourselves that we matter and that we will somehow live on even after we die. But (laughs) as C.S. Lewis pointed out, 100% of us die, (laughs) and that percentage cannot be increased. Rich and poor, fit and unfit, healthy and unhealthy, famous and unknown, there's one common denominator. We all die. Death is our common enemy. Therefore, we push back at any sign of decay or disintegration because death is not natural, and we all know it. So what can be done? What if you're not a Christian? What if you're watching this on YouTube maybe many years from now, and you're like, well, what can be done? Especially for me who doesn't you know, believe in Jesus at this point. I'm on the fence. Well, then I would put to you, this. Why not reconsider the claims of Christ? Isn't it weird that all of humanity is caught up either in trying to prolong life or trying to find life outside of this world? Why is that? Again, because we are made in the image of God. What better explanation is there? And I would say for you philosophical types, the onus is on you. You've got to answer that question. Why? And if that is the case, then why not turn to the intelligent life that does exist and has already made contact with us? The person, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Well, what about if you're a believer today? How should we think about death, disease, and the frustrations of life? Well, we should look to Christ, for He is the one who became perishable in order to make us imperishable. He is the man of heaven who took on a body of dust so that we who are made of dust might take on his heavenly body. And remember what his body looked like after the resurrection. Man, that seems pretty amazing. That's going to be a good day, isn't it? Jesus, who deserved life, experienced death so that we who deserve death might experience his new life. If that is all true, well, then that changes everything. Not just in the future, but right now. For in Jesus, the natural and the supernatural have come together. The present and the future have converged. If we have turned to Christ, then we already have His divine DNA in us, imparted to us by God, the Holy Spirit. And because that is true, that will change how we treat our family, how we treat our co-workers, our neighbors, and how we treat a lost world that is desperately seeking for victory in all the wrong places.
places. You just think about that for a second. That means that there's nothing that is happenstance. When you go and you get annoyed when you're driving home, when you get annoyed in the grocery shop or whatever, do you just get annoyed because it's messing up your schedule? Or maybe we should redeem, allow God to redeem our schedule and say, maybe God has plans that I don't know about and he wants to use me in this instance because nothing happens by accident and none of our labor for Christ is in vain. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ has given us this seed of eternal life and the victory of the resurrection. Therefore, as Paul concluded in verse 58, let us be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. Or, as George Herbert so beautifully put it, death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him just a gardener. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and I thank you uh, for the victory of your resurrection, for it gives us a certain hope in the midst of the frustrations of this life. Redeem those frustrations, Lord, through your people. Use them to draw people to yourself that they might hear your eternal words and they too might experience your victory. For we ask this all in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed.